Hello everyone, welcome again to uh, Hybrid Accounts YouTube channel and today we're just going to take a look at principles of working capital management. Actually, from our previous two lectures, part one and part two, we took a look at introduction to financial manage introduction to working capital, we took a look at uh, growth as well as networking capital, we took a look at how the advantages and disadvantages of having excess or insufficient working capital. And now we are on the principles of working capital management. Now I will take a look at four different principles. Mm -hmm. The first one being principles of equity deposition. The second one being principle of risky variation. The third one, the third one here is a principle of cost of capital. And the last one being the principle of maturity of payment. Now, just stay tuned. Just take a look at one after another until you complete them all. All right, starting with the principle of equity position. What is this? This one should be followed when managing working capital, when dealing with working capital, uh, you have to, to adhere to this principle of equity position. What do we mean by this? We mean that you should be able to make sure that every shilling, every car, every amount, every dollar that we invest, that it enhances the worth of the firm. I think you know the meaning of equity. Equity equals to assets minus liability, and equity is what is owned by the shareholders of the company. So every currency, every unit of currency, not necessarily a shilling, could be a dollar, whatever. Every unit of currency in working capital should enhance the net worth of the firm. If you think that you have invested some kind of working capital, but it's not going to enhance the equity of the company, then uh, it will just be useless. It will just be excess. It will, you will just be having excess working capital, which would, which would be of no need to the company. So the finance manager should enhance the investment in working capital in such a way to have a positive impact on equity. It's just like that. All right. Now, you know, uh, when taking a look, uh, when speaking of working capital, actually we'll, take a look, we'll see later on the working capital policies, but simply speaking, uh, the level of, you know, working capital is a told is equals to current assets in gross terms, but current assets minus current liability in net terms. So that's why we say the level of current assets can be measured with two ratios. Let's say current assets is a percentage of total assets, or current assets is a percentage of total sales. This is just the way uh, you can use to measure. So uh, let's go to the principle of risky variation. What do we mean by the principle of risky variation? You know, when speaking of working capital, working capital uh, actually ensure that the company has a uh, current asset sufficient uh, to convert them to cash so as to be able to set to maturing obligations if they arise. So the risk here refers to the susceptibility of failure to meet obligations. That means low liquidity increases risk. If the company is less liquid, that means uh, its ability to set to short-term maturing obligations uh, actually is minimum. So when saying the principle of risk variation, we say generally the higher the risk, the management is willing to take, the higher is the return that it can expect. And that's uh, the normal principle of business. The higher the risk, the higher the return. So if the current assets are reduced beyond a certain level, by having low current assets, that means that it will be difficult to set to mature short-term maturing obligations because we expect uh, to realize those current assets so as to obtain funds to set to maturing obligations in the short term. That's why we say there will be not enough liquidity to meet all obligations. So actually, there will be a high risk. And then we are at principle number three, which is the principle of cost of capital. Actually, cost of capital in financial management is the topic in its own terms. But here, I'm just going to take a look at what we mean by cost of capital. You know, to run the business, you need funds, and those funds actually could be provided by shareholders or maybe uh, loan providers. Actually, they, they give funds the entity and they require returns in advance. Returns uh, to the providers of finance in the cost of capital to the company. So how should the cost of capital be? We say mm -hmm. an optimal mix of funds, let's say from share from shareholders and and maybe loan providers, should be sought from different sources of finance as different sources have different cost of capital, and a trade off should be struck. You know, you should always strike a trade off. Why? First of all, you know the cost of shareholders, usually known as cost of equity, are uh, usually have the highest cost because they are at the, they have uh, the highest risk. You know, when speaking of shareholders, uh, they are not necessarily pay dividends, so that's a risk. 
but also the stigma of shareholders when the company is liquidated, they are the last one to be compensated. It's another risk. So in done, they would require a higher return, which means a, a higher cost of capital to the company. So while that capital is relatively cheaper, as I told you, that is cheaper than equity at the highest cost. So that is cheaper. And that is cheaper with this for different reasons. You know, when that providers, uh, they give, when they give you funds, actually they would be entitled to interest every period. So actually uh, they have less bargaining power when it comes to the return you have to give them because they have guaranteed interest. But also, even when the company uh, is in liquidation, they have to be paid first. So while the capital is relatively cheaper than equity capital, overall cost also increases with the deployment of debt capital due to the additional risk. Of course, that would have a lower risk than equity, but also when you give more debt, let's say you have lent, someone has lent you uh, $100 million, but then another one, you need more funds, and someone comes to lend you $50 million. Actually, that, that one giving $50 million would require a higher return because, for, because you, you would see that uh, there is much risk because you, you have to pay the original person who led to $100 million and also pay him the interest on that $50 million, then that would be a risk. And so a higher return would be sold. So that's why investors perceive that requiring higher returns, as I just spoke earlier. And lastly, we have the principle of maturity of payment. You know, as I told you, working capital equals to current assets minus current liabilities. That means we realize current assets and we sort of current liabilities and they arise. So we say one has to match the maturities of payments in respect of liabilities with the flow of funds meaning that cash inflows and outflows should be matched across maturities to avoid jeopardizing the liquidity and solvency of the firm. Let's say uh, a customer owes me uh, $20 million, but also the supply, I owe the supplier $15 million. If we say that they, they will both be settled in two months time, that means I'll receive money from the customer and then I'll pay the supplier. So that's why we say, we, we say the principle of maturity of payment, we try to match them. Or maybe it could be that you receive the cash in advance, maybe a bit earlier, so that when the supply has to be paid, there'll be no problem, there'll be sufficient funds to do that. So this is all about uh, the principles of working capital management. And the next session will be on working capital policies. So uh, stay tuned and welcome again. If you want to subscribe, subscribe to the channel to support it. All right, until next time.